Now, last week, you may remember that Michael had a picture of a tree. And uh, in, the, uh, in my previous talks on Beatitudes, you might remember me talking about roots, life, and fruit that uh, the Beatitudes kind of talk to. So that didn't work. There we go. Oh, so these are the eight Beatitudes. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And then finally, blessed are they who are persecuted. Oops. Blessed are they. I don't know why that's scrolling through. We'll go back. There we go. That's giving all my, all my morning away, isn't it? <laughs> Let's see if we can stop that. That's not, it's not working at all now. So, oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. Roots. Oh, I have no idea why that's scrolling through. It has. Let's go back to the start. No. Oh, well, there we go. You might have to do without the, uh, let's just see. Yeah. It's good that we've got techie in the congregation, isn't it? Is it that? Let's take that out. Yeah. There we go. Let's, um, uh, I know I need to. <laughs> There we go. Oh, it's got got that, yeah. Oop. It'll be worth it. But still doing it. I'll continue. So anyway, I was going to say there's the, there's the roots, and uh, this is the first three of the beatitudes. So the roots for a godly life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And they're the people who don't who recognize we don't have what it takes. Certainly don't have all what it takes as regards tech this morning. <laughs> and then the second is part of the roots. And uh, that is blessed are those who mourn. And it's about those who know they've got many sins which are costly to both themselves and to others. But mostly they're costly to Jesus. And then finally the third one, blessed are the meek. We haven't been treated as our sins deserve. So we acknowledge the way Jesus treats us with kindness and compassion. And then the, the next beatitude is about our life. It's about the life of godliness that springs from the work of the Holy Spirit in us as believers. So the fourth beatitude Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Then the final four deal with the fruits arising from the life of a believer. Don't worry if it's not going to work. We'll go, we'll do without. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, when we started this uh, looking at the Beatitudes, I said that being blessed isn't about happiness. It's not about how we feel. 
It's not about having riches. It's not about what we do with our leisure. It's not about an abundance of things, but it's about a divine favor that's bestowed on us when we possess certain character qualities. Matthew 5, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, I have to ask, why is it that Jesus decided that that adjective of peacemaker would be used to describe what a true Christian is, a true believer is? And I wonder this morning, when you made your list of 10 qualities or characters of Christian, how many of us included peacemaker? You may have done this morning because you knew that was what we were going to talk about, but how many of the groups, put your hand up if you included peacemaker as part of that list? The, oh, we have one. We've got inner peace. Is it similar, is it? But not quite. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that none of us church chose to put that in our list of 10, but Jesus has it in his top seven makes us think, why would Jesus choose peace? Well, and then I got to thinking, well, what is peace like? What is peace about? If we think about peace in terms of how we live in, in, in our lives, what's happened in our lives in the past, we think about wars and uh, wars ceasing. And uh, does that bring peace when wars cease? And I thought, well, maybe it probably doesn't actually. All it means is that one side has battered the other side into submission. They probably still hate each other. But that's not real peace, is it? They haven't found real peace. It's not an absence of war or conflict or strife. God's definition is something completely different. If we look, if we look at the peace that God grants us, it's all about the good stuff. We were singing this morning, I am who you say I am. God says good things about us. And, you know, when we think about what peace with God means, we're, we're going to be sitting on a throne. We've, he's prepared a mansion for us. We've got a banquet to look forward to. There's so many good things that come to us because of the peace of God, because we found peace with him. And it's a positive aspect. We're in intimacy and fellowship, we could become one with him. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this beatitude says, blessed are the peace makers. It doesn't say, blessed are the peace seekers. Now, Matthew 4, Matthew 5, 44 and 50, 45, which were going to come up on the uh, screen. I don't know whether you can show that. It's thinking, isn't it? They had really good graphics. Let me come forward. Oh. Want Matthews? That needs to go back a bit. There we are. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, it's coming back in a second. Just that's good. It'll come back in a second. This has normally worked in the past. Without a problem, isn't it, Derek? Oh. <laughs> anyway, okay, Matthew 5, 44 to 45 tells us, I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be called, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So Peacemaker is written all over that passage. And the end is that we'll be like, we'll be acting like our Father when we act like our Dad. We're imitators of him as Paul says to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5, verse 2. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, <laughs> it was perfect for a moment. John says you can tell the sons of the devil from the children of God by their characteristics. One of the great attributes of the Father is that he's a great peacemaker. And I wonder whether this morning, does that 
aspect of God fit with how you think of God? Do you think of God as a great peacemaker? You know, in the Bible, it's quite interesting that the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and then the last two chapters of the Bible in Revelation, there's peace. But the rest of the Bible is full of war. You know, as Christians, we understand that's about. But maybe non-believers might find that a bit odd. But that's the truth. You know, the Bible, quite interesting, first two and last two, it's bookended with peace. If we, if we are peacemakers, we carry the resemblance of God because we're a child of his. We carry the same characteristics. God isn't stern. He's not afar off. He's not distant. He's not harsh. We are called to be ambassadors of the, cro of the cross. We have a gospel of peace. The Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news. We are to reconcile people to God. <laughs> we realize people are fighting against our heavenly father and we know that the future will be really severe for them and we can't mess around with our gospel message peace in scripture isn't peace at all costs jesus says he brought a sword he's going to divide people some people are going to lay down their ammunition and their weapons but others won't lay, lay them down when we're talking to non-believers, we can't bend the truth. We can't bend our doctrine and the things that we, we know to be true. We plead with people to come to him. But there's no peace if people don't come to God or if they come to God short of faith and repentance. Jesus said, repent and believe. And that's how we need to see people come to Jesus. To encourage peace, we need to tell people to lay down their weapons. In Matthew 22, Jesus himself said, but people won't come. And then when you look in the Bible, and this is interesting, because it's, it links to something that Lisbeth was praying earlier. Even the most wicked people in the Bible who genuinely repented, when they come to God, he accepts them. And if you read the Bible, you'll see that without exception, no matter what they've done, if they're truly repentant, he accepts them. Okay. Okay. Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's an imperative. In the Beatitudes, it says, if you're a peacemaker, you will be called a child of God. And that means that nobody else will. So we need to be peacemakers in order to be called children of God. And the same truth is there. We're told to pursue peace. We're told to do it. Pursue peace and holiness. Not one, not the other. It's got to be peace and holiness. Otherwise, you won't be a child of God. We need to take a good look at ourselves. Are we peacemakers? You know, if you look at some people's life, strife, quarrels, and warring follows them wherever they go. Are we people that do that? Are we people who take strife, quarrels, and trouble with us wherever we go? And people don't always fight. Sometimes people run from trouble rather than addressing issues. Peace has to do with harmony, with closeness, with friendship. It's to do with things that draw people together and to God. And we need to be encouraging those things. And it's non-negotiable in those passages. Now, we've got James 4 up on the screen there. And, you know, I was thinking about what causes quarrels, what causes warring, and what causes strife to happen. So what does James 4 tell us? Well, it says, what is causing the quarrels and fights amongst you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. 
You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy with God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. These are strong words. James says that these warring thoughts and factions, they come from what pleases us, from our own desires. And they're at war with the things in our body. Our eyes see things and they want it. We lust, we don't have. We murder, we don't love others. We are the hating and the hated. We tolerate others as long as they're valuable to us. John says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. In our hearts, we've hated people. I know I have. I'm often in traffic queues. I, you know, or some, you see someone jump in in front of you. It's that sort of thing. I, in that moment, you think something that you really know you oughtn't to think about that person. And uh, sometimes we're quick to say sorry to God for our wrong thoughts. Sometimes it takes us a little while. Sometimes there's a little nudge from the passenger seat. Uh, from the person sitting next to me saying you shouldn't be like that <laughs> we all need those people don't we <laughs> our wives are wonderful at putting us straight when we uh, have those thoughts now some people may be ashamed of things in their lives so they don't even dare take it to God or they may be athe atheistic enough not to think God would even care about their situations Others see God as a kind of celestial Santa Claus who will grant them whatever they want. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. James says those who are not peacemakers are adulterers. He says it's lust. It's a lust problem. Cause in our nations or with our husband or wife and in the church. It's ugly, which is why he's using this kind of language about people who have strife following them. It says they're not intimate with God. 1 Corinthians 11 says when Christians won't repent of divisiveness, God kills them. It's a very serious matter. Romans 14 talks about people having differences of opinion in the church. And it says there's a place for instructive peace language where there are disagreements. There are certain core doctrines over which we can't argue or we, we can't say that, you know, we, we have to stick by our principles of the things that we know to be true, or the things that the Bible says. And we can't be moved over those core doctrines. But there are many things over which we can disagree. And Scripture says that's okay. And I was thinking about this, the sort of things that we might have argued over in the past couple of years. Brexit, you know, Brexit was a big divisive subject in our country. And we all have different views on that vaccines whether we should have churches open or closed in the lockdowns the, those things we can argue about they're not core doctrines they're things that we can argue about and come to different get different um, uh, decisions on the kingdom of god is about righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit it doesn't mean tranquility in my own heart the context of the verse doesn't agree with that we should pursue the things that make for peace, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We can pursue peace even when we don't agree, and we won't always agree. He who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God, it says in Romans 14, uh, verse 18. Paul wants people who are fully persuaded he wants people of strong conviction. He says in verse 5, we should each be fully convinced in our own minds. He acknowledges we'll come to different positions. And we think surely that'll cause divisions. He says no. If it's not about you being Mr. Right or Mrs. Wrong, Mrs. Right, or Mr. Great or Mrs. Great, if you're, if you're convinced that your own opinion has to be bowed down to, then that's not good. We need to be people of the word of God 
and we need to be willing to accept that we may be wrong on something. Spurgeon himself said he was happy for people to come to the church, to his church, who come to a position on something that he knew to be wrong, as long as they could present a solid biblical reason for why they believed it, because they were sold out to the Bible, to the Word of God. There's a way to pursue peace in the midst of differences of opinion. We can be mutually instructive and challenging. We can respect and love one another. And that's true in the church, or in our families, or in our workplaces. A little earlier in Romans, it says, if, it's, if it is possible, as much as it depends upon you, keep peace with all men. There are times when we've done everything we can, but the other party still isn't willing to make peace with us. Hebrews 12 says, pursue peace with all people. Romans 12, live peaceably with all men. Children of God do this. And the Bible says, by, all, by this shall all men know that you are children of God. Jesus came into the world to bring peace. He was the Prince of Peace. He came to bring peace between us and God. We don't pursue peace at all costs, not at the expense of truth or doctrine. We pursue peace at great cost to ourselves. And we put great effort in to bring peace in our, in our surroundings. Jesus came to bring this peace. He came to make us peacemakers. We're peacemakers because of him. We're sons of his because we imitate what he did. If God had stood on his rights, we'd all be headed for eternal damnation. If he said, don't they know who I am? I'm going to stand on my rights. But God didn't do that. God help us to be truly the children of God, of the God of peace. A peacemaker is one who reconciles people with God and with one another. It's not a passive thing. We must engage in actions that cultivate future harmony. God chose to reconcile the human race to himself by sending his own son to serve as the final sacrifice for our sins. We're commanded to love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. We are to imitate Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, and to work to reconcile people with God and with each other. We're Christ's ambassadors because we urge others to restore themselves to God's favour through repentance of their sins and acceptance of Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Peacemakers build bridges between people who are in discord with one another. We're to promote reconciliation and harmony, as the scripture te scriptures tell us, by doing such things as reasoning frankly with our neighbours, rebuking those who persist, persist in sin, warning those who are idle and disruptive, and discouraging people from being vindictive with one another. We also need to remember that attempts at peacemaking may fail, and they often do. The Bible tells us to promote peace only so far as it depends on us. There are people who will insist on living in strife, no matter the efforts a peacemaker puts in. I remember um, a long time ago, I used to work in a housing association, and um, there was a particular lady customer that um, was passed to from pillar to post. Um, she was a difficult lady, and um, She'd been seen by lots of different housing officers. And uh, she had, when you went to see her, she had luggage bags full of paperwork that she used to bring out and tell you how horrible my company was and uh, how awful it was. And she only had this negative view of things. And poor lady, she was riddled with arthritis. And, you know, I think sometimes the physical things can reflect upon the way that people live their lives. We can start living as peacemakers by studying the Bible to fortify our understanding of biblical justice so that we are ready to serve as peacemakers when the occasion arises. doesn't mean we run away and ignore a problem and cross our fingers 
and hope that it will go away. I know I've done that sometimes, especially in family situations. Um, family situations seems to be some of the hardest situations to actually confront. Instead, we are to pursue actions that promote goodwill, to speak up in love. There are ways of doing it by being the first to extend an olive branch to someone with whom we're clashing. We can also do this by standing up for someone whom we see as being taken advantage of in our family workplace or in our community. We serve as peacemakers also by helping to bring others to God. We can share our testimonies. We can encourage others to pray and to study the Bible. And by practicing what we preach, by living a life based on Christian principles. If we do all this, Jesus promises that the peacemaker will be blessed specifically by being called a child of God.